Right, good evening. I'm Bill McCandless, president of the Redstone Chapter of Vertical Flight Society. I'd like to welcome you to our combined live and virtual tech talk uh, co-hosted with the Philadelphia and Arizona chapters, a partnership that we've had now uh, through COVID, uh, sharing monthly content across the membership here for over a year. I'm excited we have the ability to have local members join us here in person at Radiance Technologies here in Huntsville. Uh, and I hope that uh, what we've learned over the last year can help us bring this content to more members as we as we go forward. Um, I'd ask uh, both those here and online to silence phones and microphones. Uh, I'll follow our normal virtual format and start uh, with a quick chapter update, then move to the outstations for Arizona and Philly chapter leadership uh, to speak uh, before I do any, uh, talk about how we're gonna handle questions in the introduction of our speaker. Um, the questions can be uh, either placed in the virtual environment chat window or held for live question, live Q&A here at the end. I'll serve as the moderator here for Q&A. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can uh, to take advantage of our speaker tonight. Um, I thought I'd find it helpful to write those questions as they come up so the chat window may be your best uh, chance to get the question that you'd like to have answered. Okay, so I'll go move right into the Redstone chapter update. Uh, even with the community challenges we've had over the past year, we were uh, just recently able to award a total of uh, $8,500 worth of scholarships to five incoming or current college students uh, throughout the Redstone chapter region uh, over uh, four different schools. Uh, the scholarships are possible are made possible by our two traditional yearly events. Uh, the annual Berry Basket uh, Memorial Golf Tournament, uh, which this year is scheduled for Friday, 10 September at Cambridge Club uh, up in Athens, and then our specialist meetings. Uh, this next one to be held around this time next year in 2022 on complex systems. Uh, expect a call for papers for that, for the technical community to join us for that event. And I imagine probably a mixed virtual and in-person event in August of 22. So I'll pass it over to Colton in Arizona for a quick chapter update. All right, good afternoon and good evening, everybody. My name is Colton Marchesso and I'm the program director for Vertical Flight Society Arizona. Um, our main uh, processes that we're going through right now and really our main effort is uh, we have a switch in leadership going on. Uh, so we're taking calls and uh, nominations for positions, um, everything other than vice president as well as president. Um, as kind of wrapping that up towards the end of August um, and moving into September, we're going to start taking over our regular roles. Um, and so to follow up with that, as we start looking into the months of September, October, November, and even December, uh, we will look at a couple of local events that we're probably going to host um, around the local site in Arizona. Um, but the main two that we would probably start distributing to the other chapters, such as Redstone and Philadelphia, um, we might also have an in-person event with uh, Shane Openshaw looking towards the middle of October, towards the uh, beginning of November um, for an in-person and again, virtual uh, forum. And if that all works out well, and if we are still looking for another in-person event, we will try to schedule one for the later part of the year in November or December. Otherwise, we will come back and do another uh, virtual tech talk where we will once again invite our sister chapters um, and work together for a future collaboration event. So. I think that's all I have for now. So uh, I will pass it over to the Philadelphia chapter and uh, Ada Walsh. Ada. Hey Colton, thanks for the introduction. Uh, everyone, uh, my name is Ada Walsh. I am the VP of dinner meetings here at the Philadelphia chapter. Um, and so just to give everyone a quick update on some upcoming events. Um, next week, we actually have our first in-person event in quite some time. Um, and so if you are local, um, please definitely RSVP for that. Um, and we'd like to do something um, hybrid like Redstone is doing in the future. So we'll be looking to do some of those events as well. Um, and I would also like to encourage everyone to um, sign up for the VMS technical meeting um, that was gonna be in person in Philadelphia. They transitioned to now virtual. Um, and so if you are interested, um, definitely sign up for that. That'll be next week, the 19th and um, the 20th. That's like a day and a half event. Um, and also we will be sending out something to our chapter, but um, there might be a opportunity for volunteer 
um, a, an event in September. So if you're interested in volunteering on behalf of Vertical Flight Society of Philadelphia, definitely reach out and let us know your interest. Um, and same as Colton mentioned, we are also in the midst of transitioning um, leadership. So you'll be seeing a lot of correspondence about um, new positions and new roles. Um, so be on the lookout for that. And um, that is all I had. So I will pass it back to Redstone. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Colton. Thanks, Ada. So um, we'll move into uh, the main showcase, right? So it's my distinct pleasure to welcome uh, Major General Walter T. Rugen, Director, Future Vertical Lift, Cross-Functional Team, U.S. Army Futures Command. Um, I would explain the biography, but it's too much to quote Princess Bride, so we'll sum up, right? So uh, uh, he was a uh, commissioned through United States Military Academy West Point, uh, New York in 1989, had a host of uh, operational assignments, uh, doing a, at least 159 of the 160 things you can do in Fort Campbell. Uh, most recently, in terms of, of leadership positions, uh, General Rugen was the Chief Army Aviation Force Development Division in Army G-8 in 2014, and then moved into the Director of Material Headquarters DA, uh, G-8, before serving uh, 7th Infantry Division Deputy Commanding General, uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord, Washington, 2017 to 2018. Uh, currently, and, and why we're welcome to have him here, uh, he's the director of U.S. Army's Future Commands, Future Vertical Lift Cross-Functional Team here at Redstone. So, sir, the floor is yours. Thanks. Hey, Bill, before we start, um, can you turn the camera on there? Yeah, we'll do a quick camera check. There we go. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, sir. And my mic is uh, green, so I guess I'm hot. Good. Okay, uh, next chart, please. So I'm gonna try to, uh, in about, uh, I would say 30 to 35 minutes time, um, give you all a, a broad overview of, of where we're at uh, across a number of our lines of effort, and then uh, make sure we make uh, enough time for questions to ensure that, you know, we've, uh, answer all the questions that were out there. You know, I, I told some folks uh, yesterday up at Fort Campbell, as we received resolutions from the Commonwealth of Kentucky's uh, governor and legislature and the uh, state of Tennessee's governor and legislator that, you know, they were drafted into the cross-functional team because it truly is gonna take a, a national effort to deliver this capability similar to what Army Aviation needed in the 70s to deliver um, our great Black Hawk and Apache airframes. And so thanks uh, to the Vertical Flight Society for your, um, certainly your intense interest in vertical lift. Uh, and then also, you know, your uh, great interest and great partnership with uh, future vertical lift. So thank you for the invite and, and always happy to come out. And I'll start in the upper left of the this, of this slide as we talk about um, requirements. And, and it's important to know that uh, my terms of reference um, are all centered on requirements and resourcing. That's where truly my authorities within the big A acquisition um, reside. And obviously we take it very, very seriously uh, to the point where, you know, unlike many other general officers, I'm still here three and a half years later, which I'm very humbled to be, um, but totally the right decision by the Army senior leaders again, to keep that requirements discipline. On each one of our um, efforts, we usually enter the AROC within about a year's time. And we've been uh, doing that since uh, we started. And, and again, with the future attack reconnaissance aircraft at an ICRD, uh, then an ACDD. And the re reason I'm bringing up kind of the pointed comment on ACDD is, is that Many of you who served in the past would have seen a CDD up there, you know, where we got the chisel out, we got the slab of granite out, and we started chiseling away at the requirement. That's not the case. The ACDD has been brought in uh, to, to allow for um, the flexibility we need in the uh, requirements uh, space to ensure that we don't have something that's not achievable, not affordable, or not effective in our pacing theaters. And uh, I'll get into how we're uh, 
getting after that and forming the abbreviated CDD, but suffice it to say, it's fly before we buy, right? And so we're gonna see this aggressive prototyping um, and aggressive modeling and SIM uh, and aggressive work at our Western test ranges to make sure that what we're uh, driving on capability development wise is achievable, is effective, and is affordable. Um, I also like to brag on the future attack reconnaissance aircraft effort a bit. You know, our first dollar that was ever appropriated was in uh, April of 2019. And hats off to industry and hats off to the program manager and the PEO. But in about two years, they're, uh, you can see they're 52% build. And I think they're actually a little farther because uh, the slide is maybe a couple weeks dated. But 52% built on the uh, prototypes. And that's two years flash to bang uh, plus a couple months. So the team, in my mind, the assumption I made coming out of JMRTD um, and, and Bill Lewis and the rest of Army Aviation's great vision uh, back uh, years ago is that we have a trained force on both sides of the equation, both industry uh, and um, the Army. On future long range assault, I, I'll skip over that. Uh, briskly, obviously the, uh, the RFP is out. We have a hold statement, we're in a quiet period. But what I will say there is we did what we said we were gonna do, right? So um, even through a pandemic, um, even through a four-year acceleration, um, everything is, uh, the trains are running on time. And that's a, a testament to the very talented uh, work out of the PEO, very talented and exceptional work out of Army Contracting Command. And, um, and also it gets lost a bit, but, the wonderful, wonderful seed corn that was planted by our science and technology community here at Redstone to lay that in very early uh, in a visionary a goal so it could inform the Army um, near seven years later uh, as we move out on needing this capability. Those two manned platforms are extremely important to the Army as we look at our modeling and SIM. Uh, we very much um, don't want to build a network that. Uh, uh, daisy chains, all the decisions we have to make and all the sensor hits we have to uh, work through back to some uh, decision agent that is uh, hundreds of kilometers or maybe hundreds of nautical miles to the rear. Um, what Army Aviation gives us is a very low latent decision process across F3EA, find, fix, finish, but then importantly, exploit, analyze. So did we hit what we said we were going to hit? Has it had the effect that we uh, wanted it to have? And as I get into our modeling and SIM, and I get into our uh, work at our Western test ranges, that's really uh, a master's level uh, fighting. Um, and the tactical tasks that we do as we do a movement to contact, a zone reconnaissance, uh, or a deliberate attack are very high-end things. And we don't see an AI decision agent being able to do that uh, in the 2030s. And I could give you my mosquito analogy, but I won't. If you want it later, uh, please ask. Um, the soldier's still the best sensor. Soldier sees in 3D. The soldier has commander's intent, understands, is curious. Um, and again, those low latent decisions, and we're not building this massive pipeline. One of our modeling and sims had 50,000 interactions between sensor and shooter over a core fight just for the squadron. Imagine piping all those back to some poor uh, squadron commander or brigade commander staff and have 50,000 come through, or you could just have the uh, air cab trooper running that fight forward. Um, we'll continue to make that case, and that's how we see it currently. Now, I will say as we go into unmanned systems, you're gonna hear us more and more talk about one to many, one to many. It's not man-on-man -man teaming anymore. We're really seeing this emergence of one-to-many. So for anybody in the department or uh, in the joint force that wants to criticize the Army, what I would say is the Army and Army aviators are taking this farther than anybody is in advancing the concept of one-to-many and the architecture and the, uh, the coupling of these one-to-many uh, air stack is... Uh, is wonderful to see, and this is one of the arguments I would make for why we need a digital design and clean sheet design uh, in the digital environment. Um, the one-to-many is really uh, 
exploding onto the scene as a transformational capability. Again, modular open system approach. Um, we continue to drive on this. I think it's a very hard task. We've given um, our uh, PEO, our science and technology uh, folks, our engineers and industry. But what we have to uh, understand is we have to get to uh, a governance that we all agree to. We have to get to a standard that's defined that everyone can build to. Um, and we have to uh, get in that collaborative dig digital environment. So Army Aviation has an app for that, just like everybody in society has an app for that. And uh, we upgrade at the pace of technology and we um, have an open enough system where as new capabilities emerge, we don't have to wait five to seven years. And I wish I could have you in a classified environment, but I could talk to you about case study after case study where the Army needed something and uh, hit the pause button for five to seven years because we didn't have this open system approach and uh, open system architecture. We don't want to steal industry's uh, profit margin and the innovation that comes from that, but we have to find a way on MOSA to get after a government-defined standard and a, uh, a governance policy on that to get us in this collaborative environment. I, I see that SRD is here too, and we need to work more and more uh, with our airworthiness authorities to understand how we qualify those things. And I think the reps and sets, if we haven't uh, gotten to you um, enough, uh, we need to do it more because it needs to be ready. And again, I think the team is there. I hear good things. It doesn't mean that we've solved it, but um, I am hearing uh, good movement in that regard uh, coming out of the uh, ACWIG, but also coming out of the uh, program manager's office. When we talk about our studies, and I'll go down to the lower left, the studies uh, are, are crucial, and they span uh, the things you see there, uh, really the Congressional Budget Office, that was not a study that we initiated, they initiated on themselves or by themselves to take a look at Army Aviation. I think the bluff I would tell you on that study is this. We are not the 1990s where we're doing about six ACAT-1s. We are the 1970s in, in this decade, and we're going to be doing about four, and that allows us to be affordable. Right, so we can argue till the cows come home, but it, there were different decades. Comanche was given a much tougher uh, fiscal uh, and resourcing uh, environment to fight through because we had a ton of Alpha Model Apaches, Blackhawks, Charlie uh, uh, Super Sea Chinooks. Uh, we had a 58 uh, problem. We were just seeing unmanned systems come along, and then you had Comanche. Um, and again, go back to uh, the 70s where we came out, uh, we let go of our current fleet as far as modernizing it and we jumped to the future. That's truly what the CBO report says over a multi-decade look with both FAR and FLARA in the program, we are below our multi-decade average in funding. And um, CSIS said similar things in their study, but what CSIS brought forward again from an industrial-based perspective is we have four centers where we, uh, you know, make the aircraft across the uh, joint force, three of which are Army. And if you're going to take us down to one, let us know and let the nation know which uh, two you want to close, if not two and a half. Uh, that's what CSI has said. So does the nation want to walk away from vertical lift? Uh, my argument and or apology would be no. If anything, what we're finding out of our threat systems is we need to be disaggregated from our air bases, our S pods, and APODs and disaggregated into uh, areas that are very hard to target, find out how we aggregate quickly, close the distance with superior speed range and transformational endurance in one period of darkness, strike where we want, and then return. Um, that disaggregation and that distance is how we define relative sanctuary. And honestly, the current fleet can't do it. The future fleet is going to be what does it because of that speed and that range. Um, we have another study coming out uh, with the uh, Center for Strategic and Budget Assessment, so you can see a theme. We consistently go outside of the Army to make sure we're not drinking our own bathwater when it comes to affordability, understanding what our crown jewels are, and understanding what, uh, if we bite off too much, what we won't be able to uh, afford. And uh, 
that's why it's so important that we continue to do these competitive demo and risk reduction trades across our aircraft and across our uh, mission systems to uh, find the viable product that's effective but also affordable. We're also very much looking at the entire life cycle, so the, the maintenance free operating periods and, and some of the challenges that our life cycle uh, managers have given us in our requirements documents um, that we're working towards achieving those. And again, across academia, we're seeing tremendous work and tremendous partnership um, that informs us. So yet again, the, the big tail, which is the, uh, the life cycle cost is addressed early and often. Uh, since we last spoke, uh, I would say that um, we're working very uh, diligently with our battle lab uh, down at Fort Rucker, very diligently um, with MITRE and some other uh, areas on lethality and survivability. Um, TRAC has also taken on uh, the AOA for FARA, which again, uh, very pleased with the uh, um, data we're seeing come out of all three of those uh, uh, centers uh, and the, as the data comes in, um, it's a great feedback loop into what is the upper right in our high fidelity modeling flowing into our Western test ranges. Um, the modeling is informing our aviation warfighting uh, function, doctrine, our concept, and then flowing into doctrine. I'm uh, welded uh, to the Aviation Center of Excellence down at Fort Rucker. And again, we go together on all of this to ensure that there's a, a common understanding and, a, and the vision is aligned um, and there's a situational understanding across these uh, uh, very, uh, I wouldn't say complex, but, but as we look into um, MDO, making sure that we have great alignment across the aviation six pack to ensure that we see the warfighting function uh, concept the same way. Um, I do like to brag, uh, as many of you that have been around me, on our experimentation. So we're taking all those uh, physics-based uh, modeling, uh, war games, and uh, analyses by uh, others, and we're, we're demonstrating and experimenting with them out at our Western test ranges. So our first uh, iteration of that was out at China Lake. Again, these are all against live threat emitters. Um, we uh, did Project Convergence 20 out at Yuma. We were off uh, Eglin doing some uh, extensive overwater workups uh, with our lethality packages uh, this past uh, February, March. And then uh, we were out at uh, Edge, which was Dugway, Utah in May of this year. And this is all leading up to Project Convergence 21 and the Project Convergence series. Um, and, and there's a lot to unpack here. Um, obviously, we have the, uh, the 31 plus 4. Obviously, we need to be interoperable. Um, I call it uh, loosely coupled and highly cohesive with our 31 plus 4. And, and, and there's a lot that goes on in that statement. But um, we can't afford the inflexibility of being welded to some of these things. I think in a degraded and denied environment that's highly complex, there needs to be slack in how we fight. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we ha need to have a cohesion and an interoperability in these joint kill chains that were faster than the enemy. So we outpace them and we outpace them at depth. And, and I will quote General Donahue, who's done a number of workouts, workups with us, and he's the commander of the 82nd Airborne Division. And in his warfighter in the lead up to EDGE, he uh, used a number of our systems in, uh, in his uh, week-long uh, warfighter. And he said, what we're really able to do with the aviation force is outpace the enemy at a uh, depth that they couldn't keep up with. And the tempo was just too strong for the enemy to keep up with, and we broke them far earlier. Um, when we talk about how Army aviation can hunt uh, the A2AD and hunt effectively the long range fires and hunt effectively the command and control high payoff targets, this is what's really helping these division commanders and again, this is what Army Aviation was built for. Um, it's a uh, menu of standoff and stand-in effects that are both lethal and non-lethal. And um, when you build them and bring them together as a team, and 
as a joint force team and a combined arms team, uh, we get awfully hard to beat. And I'll go into Edge uh, in more detail in the next slide after we give you the video. The, uh, the last part of the quad there is our uh, soldier touch points. And um, we've, we've had many. Uh, and I, I had a Sergeant Major uh, challenge me a few days ago um, at Fort Leavenworth um, when I talked about shooting the spike missile. And he just assumed we didn't bring the FARP team out. We brought the FARP team out. The FARP team loaded the missile. The FARP team uh, serviced the uh, nitrogen. The FARP team gave us a full assessment on the life cycle of that missile before uh, the, the aviator shot the missile. And so um, now that doesn't mean we're perfect, um, but it really set the Sergeant Major back on his heels. Of, wow, you know, you guys are, yes, we, uh, we uh, have the entire uh, life cycle of these capabilities in mind and we couldn't do it without the soldier touch points and force comm support. And we've crashed into force comm um, out of cycle a couple of times. Uh, we've crashed into uh, the Guard Bureau to ask for their assistance and also uh, the reserves to have their soldiers come out and give us a good uh, solid uh, shake out of the capabilities that we're flying and the prototypes and give us that unvarnished feedback that only soldiers can give. Um, we've had our sustainers out to see the aircraft. We've had our sustainers out to see the prototype builds of the aircraft. Uh, industry has been uh, transparent across all the platforms to ensure that our sustainers, maintainers, instructor pilots, and leaders could see it not only from an aviation point of view, but also from uh, an infantryman's point of view. And it's been highly effective. Uh, when we talk about the uh, future tactical unmanned aircraft system and the one-year soldier touch point to the five brigades, I think it sets the gold standard of what Futures Command was created to do, which is get capability quickly to uh, our soldiers, uh, get it in the hands of soldiers, get that feedback, feed it into a requirements document, which we've A-rocked, uh, and then uh, see if you can accelerate it into the BCTs because this is what they need. Um, when we look at that FTUAS, uh, those systems exceeded our expectation. Not only were they runway independent because they brought that vertical lift capability, uh, they were much quieter. They, uh, we even had one system that could fit into a Blackhawk when the goal was only one Chinook. And what you have to remember is that the Shadow takes two and a half C-130s to uh, transport. We're eliminating our ground control stations that are burdensome. We're putting uh, laptops and tablets in soldiers' hands at the front where they should be with uh, cab troopers and other uh, ground forces that need to gain and maintain contact with the enemy, and they can't afford the latency of these uh, 1990 legacy systems. Um, these aircraft flew in the rain, our shadow can't fly in the rain, and these aircraft were flown by soldiers who were doing mission command on the move or they were driving in their Humvee while they were flying the aircraft, which made them far less targetable. And if you know about the threat, they're always looking for the ground control station. They're gonna kill the head and not necessarily the appendages. Uh, truly uh, something that we grabbed from industry, um, quickly got into the field and you know, the chief uh, thought so highly of it. He asked Congress for a two year acceleration uh, with this year's chief of staff of the army, Eufer, that went over to the Hill after the budget. And, you know, although budget processes are a bit latent, um, I think, again, uh, this shows the commitment of the Army, even if it's uh, outside of the normal budgetary process, that if we need it, uh, we will ask for it. Um, and with that, let's play the video. And hopefully the video comes out to the outstations. And then I'm going to um, get in depth with what we did out at Dugway Proving Ground. Could we play the video? Sure, uh, just as an FYI um, to the folks in Redstone, when I do start playing the video, you will be automatically muted. Uh, so just as an FYI, if you wanted to narrate over the video as it's being played. No problem. With that, I'll go ahead and start sharing the video.
Okay. So obviously that's our HUA video, um, but there's a lot in there. Uh, again, you saw a tremendous partnership uh, with the United States Marine Corps. Um, they, they did two tanks in and two tanks out from Miramar uh, for four days. So that was a commitment from uh, the Deputy uh, Commandant for Aviation. Um, and, and again, we're doing two use cases. So we were doing a long range fire and a joint force penetration against uh, significant um, anti-axis area denial capability. Uh, and then once we uh, penetrated and, and uh, opened a corridor, we uh, used that corridor to air assault um, the 82nd in. We were uh, heavily partnered with uh, US SOCOM as well. Um, the Gray Eagles you say there are really uh, our surrogate for FARA. So as the Gray Eagles, um, we've been able to, uh, with a number of technologies, fracture out the flight critical from the mission system with the uh, evil geniuses at uh, the 160th and SIMO. And uh, we're able to put a mission system package on there and a uh, electronic warfare package on there that replicates what we uh, think some of the capabilities will have on FARA. Uh, and then the speed and the range of Gray Eagle more replicates what we're going to see out of FARA as well, and it helps us with the battlefield geometry. Um, we partnered heavily with INSCOM. You, you saw a, a fixed wing aircraft there. We're very much in the competition phase, wanting to understand deep sense and deep sensing capabilities. Um, and then having those deep sensing capabilities, and that's code for a, a TS or a top secret collect, get a cross domain solution down to uh, maybe a coalition squad leader in the future on their ATAC device, their tablet. And so when you think about those cross domain solutions and how we protect the source and boil it down, uh, we're working very heavily on that, again, to make uh, our tactical edge nodes very lethal. And they're going to need the intel to be very lethal, and that intel needs to be extremely low latent. And uh, and I got to stop there; I'll get in trouble. Um, partner very heavily with the 82nd. The 82nd, uh, um, you know, not only did they give blood, but they donated uh, organs. You know, General Donahue came uh, directly from uh, Lithuania and a jump there, uh, red eye into Dugway with his division tack. Um, so we had almost 100 uh, of his division headquarters there um, running this operation. Uh, the operation concept was basically an island hopping campaign in the, uh, in the Southern Pacific. Uh, and I'm sure you can fill in from there. Um, we also partnered with the Strategic Capabilities Office out of DOD. Um, obviously, Army Futures Command and five of the CFTs were out there. So we had uh, APNT. Obviously, FEL, soldier lethality, STE, uh, and network. We also importantly had the ISR and AI task forces that uh, are CFT like. Overall, 20 organizations um, working on, again, this uh, highly cohesive, loosely coupled joint kill chain um, on our critical path, which is. Uh, we, we believe and we assess as the penetration phase and that initial exploitation in MDO. So setting those conditions so we generate joint force freedom of maneuver. And as a Senate staffer told me uh, as we explain this, um, you know, we start a lot of wars with helicopters, and we do, because that lower tier of the air domain is, is a place where we can uh, close with and uh, surprise our enemy with multiple dilemmas at a time and place of our choosing. And um, EDGE uh, helped prove that out. We ran uh, a tech maturation of a resilient uh, communication network and architecture. Um, we were much more successful than PC20, not nearly as successful as we wanna be. We ran seven waveforms out there, a couple of which were classified, um, but we're working in that space. And what I've challenged the team is let's build our uh, data that we need to clear fires on based on the data pipe we have, not the data pipe we want. And so aviation has to stop uh, crushing the network. Um, otherwise, we're going to find ourselves you know, out of a job. Um, we got to find a way to uh, be very uh, nuanced on the network and get our minimum amount of information that's viable back to uh, decision makers. 
We used a lot of chipsets. Uh, we used some blockchain technology to really drive that down to kilobytes versus megabytes. And uh, again, thanks to our partners at our SOAC, um, the 160th and SIMO for helping us uh, see ourselves in that regard. The kill chain interoperability was a lot of fun with the Marine Corps, um, a lot of fun with our electronic warfare uh, assets. And um, again, good work uh, running that uh, network and the cross-domain solutions into a live division TAC full of professionals that were uh, uh, you know, PhD level folks. Um, you might've saw the uh, Blackhawk on stilts. That was our AI uh, Blackhawk. So it has a decision agent on it. I don't wanna oversell the AI piece of this. Uh, we still see it as helping us refine the battlefield, helping decision makers not being a decision agent, but as it looks out there in a uh, multimodal way, uh, it did help um, and we used it to um, spur a contingency um, within the air assault. And again, <clears throat> when you think about um, air assault ops, and many of you have been out there, I, I wish I could quote you on some of the Randy Cochran awesome quotes I had when I was a lieutenant, and he was my uh, commander in 9th Battalion, but I'll, I'll save that for another time. But, um, you know, we'd get a change on San DZ, and it was dark, and there was aircraft all over, and they weren't telling nobody there was a change, you know, because they just weren't all going to get it. Uh, what we saw here was an ability to auto-populate through, uh, kind of think of Wi-Fi in your house, where your phone just picks up that it's in the house and now it's on Wi-Fi. And so both the uh, division TAC, the ground tactical commander, and the uh, not only the air mission commander, but the, gr the air crews and all of the soldiers that had an ATEC device got auto-populated multiple contingencies uh, during the staging plan, during the uh, en route air movement plan, and then during the, the uh, ground tactical plan. So really see a lot of upside to that. Um, and we worked with PEO Soldier on, on many of that. We did a ton of machine-to-machine -machine targeting again, again, closing that kill chain where we can, where the machines do a better job of moving data, we're gonna do that and then have a soldier on the loop to uh, say, yes, fires are cleared, shoot. Um, you saw some long range effects that we used, uh, the F-35s, our ISR task force, and the FARA surrogates really helped find and fix uh, those threats. And then uh, obviously the long range effects and the F-35s uh, finished the effects um, with an immediate exploit analyze to make sure we hit what we said we were going to hit. We had a ton of distributed control of UAVs. Um, this is uh, something that the 82nd was extremely excited about. Uh, we eliminate C5s, sorties, with um, the elimination of ground control stations when we talk about uh, deploying a, a company of Gray Eagles. And so that equipment density is driving from um, multiple trucks and, and multiple connexes down to a couple Pelican cases. And a couple Pelican cases can control uh, all the Gray Eagles if you want it to. And oh, by the way, there's no training um, um, hit on that. The simulator is right in the computer that is on the uh, multiple screens. So if, if your soldiers need to train or if they need to uh, do any maintenance, it's all the same as the ground control station, only now it's in a couple Pelican boxes. Uh, also superior to our ground control stations, these, uh, these uh, distributed control laptops can fly multiple Gray Eagles or multiple air launched effects or multiple shadows, uh, and they can do so all at the same time. So when we talk about one to many, um, we're letting the machines do it, the machines do well, uh, the soldiers are there to uh, uh, obviously lead that effort. Um, but what it, it uh, opened up was an ability as we, uh, you saw young Lieutenant Whalen there, uh, as he stepped off the aircraft, he could move, and I, I wanna say fly, but he was never flying the aircraft, the unmanned systems. He was moving them to where he needed them. Um, and with the level of interoperability, you can envision this, it's kind of like Call of Duty. You know, he grabs it, does what he wants to do with it, and then hands it back, and the operators can, can grab it back. Uh, that level of 
interoperability is lower than obviously the operator who's back with uh, uh, the unit. And it doesn't include the simulation and the maintenance, but uh, Lieutenant Whalen could move the sensors with his ATAC device. He could uh, push uh, one aircraft away, pull another one in, and at times was uh, uh, moving around six uh, of our drones, be it ALE or Gray Eagles, to cover his dead space as he fired and maneuvered on the objective. And he was doing it in a very low latent manner because he's doing what he wanted to do, not what he was having to maybe merc check back to a operator who was uh, on an airfield and didn't know what the mission was or what was happening. So the relevancy was there and it was, uh, it was great. We did some more real-time auto rerouting um, for threat avoidance, weather avoidance. So the machines know when a threat pops up and we know we need to uh, uh, stay away or weather. Um, we did some additional work with uh, auto processing uh, and exploitation of, uh, of Intel at edge nodes. I don't want to oversell that either. That's very hard work, uh, but we are working in that space to uh, try to get processes out where the machine does it in an autonomous way and gives the commander what they uh, need. Um, the long range effects, we still have a goal to get out uh, to the core fire force support coordination line with Army Aviation organic to the cab capabilities. We're seeing that. Um, and in this case, uh, where the, you may have, if you were listening closely to the, the Project Convergence 20, our mesh network got very brittle at 62 kilometers. Um, what the guys did this time is uh, we tunneled in our TCDL uh, data link, we tunneled the mesh network. So we didn't have the mesh cover the whole bubble of Dugway. We tunneled where we wanted littler domes and that really uh, kept the mesh network uh, agile and that common operating picture and General Donahue um, challenged us, you know, he wants to be on one pane of glass with his Intel uh, operational and uh, he said logistics too, but uh, that gets tough. Um, but that, that fight, he wants his fight on one pane of glass so he can uh, fight it and have the common operational picture at Echelon. Um, we didn't quite get there, we got to about two, but uh, we're making great progress. The ap and stuff uh, was working very well. And uh, the electronic warfare stuff, uh, which uh, is, is mostly classified, was working very, very well too. And what I wanna just tell the force here is, you know, we're gonna be in that space in Army Aviation. As we look at RISTA, reconnaissance, surveillance, target acquisition, we're gonna be in the EW uh, space and we're partnering very, very well with the division or the, uh, uh, the Army G2 and Army uh, Cyber Command. MOSA, very uh, pleased with, with the efforts on MOSA. We'd have probably some people turn their nose up to it. Um, as an operational guy like me, I just know I want some. Um, and as I saw uh, payloads on and off uh, the A3I Gray Eagles, that's what I want, right? So we can make it more complicated than that, and I'm sure you all will, but uh, I don't think we do. You know, find a way, get it done. Um, you know, this multi core processing and bringing a card instead of a black box. We've got 50 black boxes on the Apache. Can't have that. Can't have it on far. So um, let's let's get to Mosa um, and and give us a tailorable way to get after this. Um, and the air loss effects, uh, you know, again did great. And uh, you can see in our, um, our contract actions um, how we're doubling down on that. But uh, really proud of the uh, again aviation and missile center team. They've delivered. Uh, over a thousand sorties and and again, just a tremendous capability and it's eye popping. And with that, I've talked too long, but uh, I think we got about 13 minutes for questions. Should have given me the hook earlier. Yeah, we're in a real room now, so the real hook exists, right? So that's great. Yeah, yeah. Right, so uh, thanks, sir. So we're gonna open up the floor to questions. Uh, I know Dr. Luce is already reaching for the microphone, so I'll I'll get to Here have President's go. privilege to answer one before <laughs> he does, ask one before he does. And sir, you spoke to flexibility and taking advantage of the landscape. Um, where do you see an opportunity for Army Aviation that hasn't really been decided yet? Right? Is there a space that you think that you still think, reach? Yeah, I think DVE. I think uh, that requirement document is, is is very much in work. It's informed by the DVEPS program that that took place in the 160th and 
in first ACB uh, air cab divi division cab. Um, so the first cab guys are finishing up their look at it. They're informing that requirement. That requirement is in draft form, but we want heads up, eyes up, right? We want heads up, eyes out for DVE. Um, we think uh, there's an augmented reality piece of this, right? So um, you guys are already doing some some fused, uh, you know, DTED and with symbology. Um, again, let's not make this too too hard, right? We're we're not going to get um, things that are highly complex and pilotage through SRD without some reps and sets on something that's just a pilot aid. And we should not crash into SRD and say we need, you know, to solve world hunger and malaria when we could just do something like we did with MVGs and, and build it over time. That's very much uh, coming and uh, very much what we have to do. We owe the crews uh, better um, visibility whether it be virtual or um, through a sensor, um, in their, you know, eyes, um, and I've seen systems that do it today. So let's let's get it done. And as that requirement document comes out, I think you'll see us follow through finally on that. Um, everybody's got a lot of opinions on this, and it's it's taken me a while to uh, heard some people. Yes, sir. Thanks, uh, Dr. Lewis. Yeah. Hey, sir. Uh, one of the technologies that we look at is all the big data, machine learning, all the way up to AI, autonomy, those kind of things. And recently in, in, uh, in the news, we've seen that uh, companies who deal with that kind of technology are buying platforms, Altius being, yep. being bought, Martin being bought by companies that want to inject their technologies into those vehicles to demonstrate and and do their mission sets. So obviously that's helpful to, to the, the community in terms of capability build. But what other areas or what other kinds of things do you th would you like to see companies reach out and, and do more of that um, internal development effort to help you? That, that's a great question. And um, I'll give it to you this way and it, it it, it'll probably not, um, you know, because we, it'll, you'll have to rely on some of your own innovation. But when we look at the stand-in and stand-off effects, that's really where I see a growth industry. I think more and more we're going to have uh, our systems pushed out, and and we need to have more and more systems that we can control that stand in at an asymmetric cost advantage. Um, so this is where the ALEs are, are very, very uh, compelling. Um, and we have to keep them cheap and we can't chase um, boutique things. We want some mass there. Um, I think when we talk about uh, multi-core processing and, um, and marrying that with uh, achieving MOSA, uh, very much want that. And um, I sense a bit of resistance in uh, industry because it is, um, I wouldn't characterize it as radical, but they may think of it as radical we just need what others already have in Army Aviation. Um, and we, we do need that. And, and I very much want to park one of our, you know, Teslas in the hangar over a long weekend and have the digital thread um, have already updated the digital twin and then the digital twin goes to updating that aircraft along with the crew chief's laptop, all the pubs, all the maintenance manuals, all the checklists, and then get back to the simulator and update that, and we should have that, right? So this digital environment, I don't think we've plumbed the depth of it yet, um, but what I'm mindful of is I had a cab command, and we were upgrading, I think, the Apaches to 14.7 software the entire two years I was in command, and then you had this problem where you had different, you know, software drops for different aircraft. Maintainers had to go back and check uh, the traps on multiple software drops. Uh, the operators had to do that. And then the simulator wasn't concurrent. What's that all about, right? So I would say those are kind of some things that uh, rub. Um, but honestly, you know, if you guys have something, and you guys know I take every meeting, if you have something out in industry that you think is innovative, give us a call. We take every call. We take every meeting.
Yes, sir. So I, I'm pulling the chat questions up right now. So we'll take one from from online. Uh, Okay, so, uh, and so you might have spoke to it just a little bit, right? But the question, uh, unfiltered from the virtual audience, is is DV still on life support or will it get additional funding to move forward with the program, right? And I think you were just speaking to that. Yeah, no, it's not It's not on life support. I think um, it's, it's very much uh, on our mind, but uh, it gets into what's effective and what's affordable. So, so a three sensor solution and the swap it brings to our aircraft it's not affordable with funding or with weight, right? So our mission is not to be DVE. Our mission is to close with and destroy, you know? Um, so uh, we need that elegant solution. Um, and, and I think it's there with, with some of the two sensor work we're doing and some of the augmented reality I'm seeing. Um, I think we've, we've really turned a corner and we've, we've gotten into the affordability bucket with the effectiveness bucket. Okay, great, thank you. So I've got another one for you. Uh, I've heard from the s and perspective that uh, the tech, you're pushing the technology community towards energy efficiency, uh, using renewable energy in a holistic way. Can you expand a little bit on that vision there? Sure, so I mean, you know, ITEP doesn't get uh, um, credit for really being a green energy initiative, but it's it's pretty compelling when you look at the number of Blackhawks, Apaches, and Faras we're going to have that burn um, at the threshold 12% less fuel. They're running the traps on that for me now, based on uh, something an Army senior leader asked me on how many you know pounds or gallons of gas that is, but it's a lot over a flight hour program over a year. Um, we we are looking at electrification. We've seen some exciting things on hybrid engines that uh, I think when Bill Lewis and I first kicked this off, we, we didn't really see, um, but there is some growth in that space that uh, has the shaft horsepower that, that they're edging up on being compelling to us. Obviously, you know, we have a lot of electric engines with our UAS too. So um, we're, we're seeing a lot of good work in this and we wanna leverage that. Um, when we look at the supplemental power units for, for both uh, performers on FARA, um, I think that's also a space that we may um, drive towards an increment two or an increment three is, you know, can you achieve a hybrid engine um, that is useful in that SPU class and again, make FARA all the better. Okay, great. We've got a question from online uh, and they had a problem seeing the second slide for the edge briefing and the briefing. So if we could bring that up from the national side, that'd be great. And then, uh, Julius, if you're, if you're able to come online, if you have a question to that, that'd be great. Over. Yeah, the print, I apologize, the print is awful small. It's because we did, you know, guys did so much, but uh, no. Okay, uh, Julius, then, you uh, should be uh, able to uh, pose your question go now. Go ahead. Yeah, so we'll let, we'll let you set the stage for a minute and then we'll see if Julius has a question. No, I, again, I, I go back to this. I mean, it, we've got to be joint. We've got to be combined arms. Um, you know, you can't grade us in a, uh, in a vacuum, um, nor do we want to be graded in a vacuum. We've never fought alone. We'll always fight together and we'll win together. Um, and anybody that gets graded alone, I think we'll, we'll, uh, we'll lose in, in, uh, in any future fight. And so this is an effort to really show uh, those joint kill chains in an interoperable fashion. And again, I, I go back to this uh, highly cohesive, loosely coupled. So if something can't do it, we need something else to come right behind it and do it, right? On any one of the find, fix, finish, exploit, analyze. And that's what this uh, team does. And it's not necessarily a team of teams. Um, so it's not this highly you know, welded together. If we don't have one piece of it, it doesn't work. No, it's it's the the other. It's the opposite of that. It's it's a uh, it's a uh, cohesive, and, and that cohesiveness allows you to fight if if one's weaker or one's stronger or one's missing and one's still there. Um, the network is is important, but it's not everything. And and I say that because if it's degraded or denied comms, we still got to fight. We're not giving up because the network the network's not the mission. The network's an enabler. 
And so we still have to find, fix, finish. And if uh, a soldier needs to do that, they will. Uh, and we need to equip them as such. One thing I'll hit um, as we're kind of in a lull with, with questions is um, some of the analysis we're seeing out of our costing work. And <clears throat> what I would tell you is, you know, if we don't do these two things, um, you know, what are we going to say to the guys that are fighting in 2035? You know, if if they don't have these future capabilities that are um, part of the digital age, you know, if we're still stuck in the analog age um, with these original designs, we're seeing significant swap issues as we try to retroactively assess whether we can put some of these futuristic capabilities on. That's not to say industry couldn't do it, but um, it, it gets tough with the swap. And we're going to have recapitalization bills anyway uh, if, if we don't do these two aircraft. So are we just going to be satisfied with what um, kind of the 80s birthed with just better um, cockpits in them? I mean, that's really where we're at because they don't go any faster. Uh, they don't go any farther. And, um, you know, I guess we could put a better sensor on, but I don't think that's going to win the day. We're going to need the kind of reach. And the reach is not just in the aircraft. It's also in the munition. It's also in the electronic, electromagnetic spectrum. And it's also in the digital spectrum. And I think, again, the Army needs these clean sheet designs to uh, fully ring all that out. Okay, great. So I'll open the uh, question back up to the net for uh, Mr. Randall, or Riggle, excuse me, uh, if there was a specific question here. J.R. Rigoli. Nope. Okay, nothing heard. All right, so uh, back back here to the room. Let me try one more. Hey, sir, when I was down at Rucker a couple weeks ago, you know, they talked about the different ways of doing the fight, but you know, you're you're doing an island hopping scenario. It it would seem to me that they would be teaching how to do island hopping at Fort Rucker. They are, yeah. It's and, coming. And but it seems to me like we still talk about uh, flying formation in an age that we have auto um, uh, programs. Sure, sure. No. To get you on. So everybody can arrive within five seconds of each other, whether they're on the wing of one or not. But we still talk about the, the typical kinds of things. Now, in Comanche, we had a hell of a time trying to sell the new way to fight the aircraft. Do you see the same kind of resistance? I, I don't. With I, new aircraft? Like I, I, I mentioned, you know, Rucker and I are, are welded at the hip. Um, uh, General Francis and I share the vision. His team has had a lot of input into the vision. So it's it's not been a you know force feeding from the cross functional team, um, and again across the seated and uh, my G three we've really been out to the uh, younger generation to talk to them about our thinking on this and get their feedback quite often. Um, so I don't see it. Uh, I, I already see a change in the MOI coming out of Fort Rucker. Um, they're doing things they can do with the current fleet, which is. Uh, far more training on low-level flight. Uh, they just did a total revamp of emergency procedures to, uh, again, um, is there a ton of underlying procedures that you're memorizing and then messing up when uh, you have a very acute uh, problem and you're pulling off wrong uh, power control levers and such. So I would applaud General Francis. And he's got a, that's a very finite list. He's got a whole list of how we're informing training. Uh, I'd love to show you guys the decision support template that our, our SAMS graduates uh, in the CDID and FVL CFT have put together across the Dotland PF, the knowledge points, what's informing the knowledge point, and then what's the uh, outcome of that. And it's it's across everything and it's exhaustive and it's uh, it's temporal as well. So they have assessed when they think they can make that decision on flipping the switch on any number of training, any number of doctrine. Uh, facilities, everything. And it's uh, it's a tremendous product. And uh, it was, you know, the vice asked for it at one of our meetings and, uh, you know, the seated director just, boom, right on the table. It's impressive because Army Aviation, yet again, is is just well ahead on doing all the Dotlam uh, PFP analysis. And, and they are. I've, I've been wicked impressed with what they've been doing. 
Okay, sir. So I think we're closed down questions. Um, we have a small token of appreciation here from the rest of chapter. Uh, if you can catch all the rainstorm stuff outside on the way in, you'll be hydrated for your ride home. Right, there you sir. Go. But thank you very much. All right. So thanks for your time and thanks for working this through today on the mixed environment. And and we're here, obviously, ready to ready to help as much as we can. Absolutely. So, hey, thank thanks you. for your interest. And like I said, you're all drafted in the cross cross functional team. Thanks. Okay, great. So we'll shut down, uh, Colton and VFS, we'll shut down the, the net call and then uh, we're gonna do some local stuff here. But thanks for those that joined and uh, we look forward to next month when we do our, our next speaker. All right, thank you, Mike. Have a good night. Thanks, Bill.